International Research and Educational Society presents Derek Partridge, Jordan Maxwell, and special guest Bill Jenkins. Hello, I'm Derek Partridge. Because of the nature of this program, we felt that it was important for me to tell you a little about my background. I've been a journalist, author, TV reporter, news anchor, and talk show host for some 30 years in England, Rhodesia, and the United States, where I was a news anchor with Financial News Network, hosted Law in America, and Emmy Award-winning PBS specials. I've also been a spokesman for such companies as Bank of America, Transamerica Occidental, the American Red Cross, Warner Brothers, and Arm and Hammer. I've never belonged to any organized religious group, and my personal beliefs are simple and basic, to do the most conscious good and the least conscious evil during my life. Mr. Bill Jenkins. Man's religions, all from the very beginning of recorded time, even into the pre-Cro-Mangan days, is filled with symbolism and traditions as he tried to do something to put himself right with forces greater than he his creator could have been a fire or a cloud or a mountain as man became more sophisticated he became more sophisticated in his concept of really what that power was above him but with all of those traditions came symbolism symbolism for Judaism and Christianity is this the Holy Grail, filled with wine. Or was it blood? To find out more about that symbolism, let's go to Barbara Walker's book, A Woman's Dictionary of Symbols and Sacred Objects, to find out about the cup. Symbolism of the cup is complex, beginning with matriarchal images of the womb vessel and passing on to its patriarchal replacement, another kind of blood-filled chalice of resurrection. The cup remained, the blood was masculinized. The womb's life-giving moon blood was reinterpreted as the blood of a male who naturally had to die to produce it because men never could learn the female trick of bleeding without injury, though it wasn't for lack of trying. In dying, the male victim became a savior whose blood was supposed to give rebirth just as mother blood used to do. Symbolism. Symbolism in all of our religious life. But the ancients were right. Those that predate even Judaism and Christianity. There is something about having a proper relationship with forces greater than you. Today we'd say there is something right about having a proper relationship with the creator of this universe. Our creator. Many believe that there is a part piece of that creator who is a part of us that we need these learning experiences to become more godly. That our nature, character, and personality is naturally the same nature, character, and personality as the one who created us. Now the question is, does that come in myths? Does that come to you through traditions, ritual, rote? Or does it come through doing, really wanting to be that way? Not doing it out of fear. Not doing it because someone told you that if you do certain things, that you will be very godly. That you will be actually fulfilling this great need, which is a part of all of us, and that is to have a right relationship with that force greater than us, the Creator, God. Let's look at this symbol of Christianity, the cup filled with wine. It had its origin in Christian history, when Jesus had the Last Supper with the disciples and he told them that this cup, which was filled with wine then, represented his blood, which was given for the salvation of all mankind. Here again, the masculine giving his blood, whereas the woman can give her blood without hurting. Traditions, symbolisms. Is there anything magical, really, about a cup of wine? 
Later on, the grail or the cup itself took on great new powers and became known as the Holy Grail, and it was what caused the Crusades to go down and search for it. It's magical wonders. Really. Are we looking for magic when we look to try to improve the quality of our spiritual life? Or are we using tradition and ritual and rote as an easy way out from doing the very hard task of being a loving, caring, godly person? It takes determination. It takes will. It takes desire. And it takes understanding. Do you get that understanding from reading books of myths? Do you get that understanding from reading the story of Jesus, which sounds almost like the story of Krishna, which sounds almost like so many others, as you'll hear about here? Or do you get that understanding from an inward knowing, from the very spiritual voice that you have within you? We're talking about your spiritual involvement, your spiritual growth. It is not done by doing things. It is done by being something special. In this program we're going to deal in verifiable facts, something that cannot readily be found in most aspects of most religious beliefs. Every one of the world's thousands of different religions claims to represent the only truth, which of course implies that all the others do not. So if you have chosen to be, or through parental upbringing or school education, became a believer, how can you be sure that your particular faith is the right one. Okay, let's suppose it is. Well, that would then make everyone else in the world sinners. But on the other hand, if your faith happens not to be the correct only one truth, then that would make you a sinner, wouldn't it? And if you're a non-believer, does that mean that you will have to pay an eternal price for your non-belief after your death just because you didn't believe? After centuries of human existence, no one has ever yet come back from the dead with incontrovertible proof that there is anything beyond death, which also means that countless thousands of people who have spent their lives preparing for the next life may just have been wasting their time. And even if we suppose that there is something after death, as no one knows exactly what it is, how can you possibly prepare yourself for an entirely unknown situation? Although it must be acknowledged that a great deal of good has been done in the name of religion, it is by far the saddest and most tragic aspect of religion that throughout history more men, women and children have been slaughtered, tortured and mutilated because of religious beliefs than all the people who have died in all of history's secular or non-religious wars. Even more sadly, in today's supposedly enlightened age, the slaughter, the torture, the mutilation, and the deprivation of basic human rights continues unabated. And weren't we taught that religion was supposed to be something to do with love? Despite this, there are still those who will argue that religion, regardless of its origin or credibility, serves a valuable and benevolent purpose in society because of the underlying teachings about being a godly or simply a good person. Again, sadly, the facts contradict this view. As in most countries where religion is widely practiced, there are more social problems and more crime than in many other countries where the practice of religion is less common. So the equation that being religious equals being a godly or good person is a long way from being universally true. And by studying the facts of history, we will find that it has never worked this way. Of course, one must acknowledge that, as with any rule, there are exceptions. But the godly or good persons are distinctly in the minority compared to all the evil that has been committed and continues to be committed, all in the name of religion and God. Consider just a few historical examples. The Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the slaughter of Christians in Rome's Colosseum, the Catholic massacre of the Huguenots in France, 
the burning and drowning of witches at Salem, Massachusetts. And then today, Arabs and Jews continue to kill each other throughout the Middle East. Catholics and Protestants murder each other in the streets of Northern Ireland. Hindus and Muslims assassinate and massacre each other in India and Pakistan. And Christians and Muslims decimate each other in Beirut. As religion is the cause of all this slaughter, religion cannot possibly be the solution. It is not only murder and torture. How about the daylight robbery and extortion through implied threats and induced fear of your money by self-centered, corrupt, and sex-scandal-ridden televangelists? These people with their artistically groomed and moosed flowing locks, their fashion designer clothes, I'm talking about the men, and the women with their thick makeup, garish lips and false eyelashes, have you ever seen such vanity? And religion is supposed to espouse humility. What we will now offer you are facts, not fiction, myths, fairy tales, and allegory. However, as is often the nature of facts, they will probably be very uncomfortable for many people. They will undoubtedly shock and anger some of you as they will challenge age-old beliefs and the very basis of the religious belief system on which you may have based your whole life. But these facts cannot possibly be as shocking and ungodly as the death, destruction, robbery and suppression of truth that for centuries has epitomized the practice of religion. And please remember that I deliberately said offer you facts, as it is not our intention to be like so many missionaries and other religious proselytizers whose purpose it is to force you to change your beliefs under the threats of hellfire and eternal damnation if you don't. We just want you to listen, watch, and make up your own minds. In order to better understand what we humans are today, and so what we are likely to become tomorrow, we need to look back and study our origins and where we came from. Try now to imagine Earth in prehistoric times, a place filled with a multitude of dangers, giant animals and reptiles, huge predators, earthquakes, volcanoes, tornadoes and meteors, and the subsequent fear and hostility such an unfriendly environment would breed. If you could be a time traveler and be spirited back to these ancient times, complete with all the sophisticated modern knowledge you now have, admit it, you'd be scared to death, I know I would be. Now try to imagine what it must have been like for these ancient people, totally devoid of all the knowledge we now take for granted about the awesome forces of nature. A volcano erupts, destroying everything in its path. The sky reverberates with thunder as a violent electrical storm hurls thunderbolts to Earth, which start fires. Tornadoes sweep people, animals and trees away into the sky. The Earth opens up and an earthquake swallows a village in the twinkling of an eye. Pretty scary stuff, still is today. But try and think of it as if you had absolutely no understanding of these natural occurrences at all. Then at night, gazing up into those fearsome skies filled with infinite numbers of stars, not to mention shooting stars, without having the remotest idea of what they were. I slept in the desert at Petra in Jordan. The stars are not above you. They surround you like a giant canopy and in the crystal clear air, you feel as if you can reach out and pluck one from the sky. However, lacking any form of scientific explanation, is it any wonder that these ancient peoples created a myriad of all-powerful nature gods and the countless myths that surrounded them? The gods which have been worshipped and sacrificed to for thousands of years since? For example, it was the mighty Thor who, when angry, struck his anvil with his hammer and created thunder. And the same Thor who, from his abode in the clouds, or heavens, on his lightning bolt at the terror-struck mortals below. If, alone in the dense forest, you, hardly surprisingly, felt fearful, and you sensed the presence of an unknown threat, well, that had to be the forest god, Pan, from whom we get our word panic. And at night, when it became cold, dark, dangerous, and downright frightening, without a convenient and comforting light switch, who else came out to rule but the fearsome Prince of Darkness? Then came the dawn, and with it light, warmth, and new life. And who brought it, and in so doing defeated the Prince of Darkness? 
none other than the sun, which became known as God's sun, the light of the world. Human beings are the only creatures capable of the process of logical thought, of imagination, and of questioning everything around them. In fact, the very evolution of humans has been dependent upon our ability to seek, find answers, and adapt. However, a small weakness has been that if a logical answer was not readily available, human imagination often invented or created suitable and at least temporarily satisfying answers such as the very basic need to have a reason to explain our existence, and the equally important need to feel that life must be for some purpose, and that it cannot simply end at death, but that there must be something beyond. This remains as true today as it was for ancient man. Consider again how little ancient man knew compared to us. In order to create some livable with explanation, gods and myths had to be created, all questions require answers, real or created, so that we can get on with life. So perhaps we can also understand why people sometimes killed or sacrificed other human beings to satisfy or placate the angry gods of nature. For example, to, uh, to try and stop Thor from hurling a thunderbolt specifically at you. At the time, man didn't know any better. Supposedly today, we do know better. Sometimes you, like me, I wonder if we really do. Despite the existence of many larger and more powerful creatures in the jungles, man became and remains today the undisputed ruler of the earth for one simple reason, his mind. To make the closest analogy, we are both smaller and weaker than gorillas, but our minds are considerably more powerful and sophisticated. And yet, we continue to shed blood today, perhaps even more than before, and still in the name of the same God or gods and the same myths. Haven't we learned anything? Ancient man had to contend with countless areas of ignorance, which over the centuries gave way to informed enlightenment, with just two glaring exceptions. We still persist in the ancient ignorances of religion and myths, two words which have one definition in common. They are both nothing more than beliefs. Look at it this way. Would you consider running your business according to an instruction manual written some three to four thousand years ago and then translated twenty or more times before you read it? I very much doubt it. Yet many of us unquestioningly base the entire conduct of our lives on just such a manual, a collection of stories called the Bible. It is not merely having a superior mind that has allowed man to rule or dominate the earth, but by using it to create the ever-increasing array of technical wonders, sadly all too many of which are devoted to the sole purpose of destroying fellow man. That mind has not really changed much over the last few centuries, but because some brave people refuse to accept invented, convenient or expedient answers, such as the earth being flat, you know, it was once religious heresy, punishable by death to believe otherwise. And instead they continued to question and explore until such time as a logical and provable answer could be ascertained. Because of that, we have been able to progress from caveman to modern man, but still with the previously noted and glaring exception of religion, where we still stubbornly cling to unproven and unprovable centuries-old myths. Moreover, Many religions tell their followers not to think, but to blindly follow their moral dictates. Just as soldiers are drilled not to think, but to blindly follow orders. Isn't it strange how the orders issued by both religious and military leaders are often exactly the same? Go out and kill some of your fellow human beings. And both of them justify their killings in the same way, as being in the name of God. Surely our inbred, unique ability to think and reason was intended to be used to its fullest extent and capacity. So why the exceptions of religions and the myths on which they are based? Religions which still set out to keep people in ignorance. For instance, the Jesuit Index of Forbidden Books was described by Catholic brother Paolo Sarpi as the finest secret device ever invented for applying religion 
to the purpose of making men stupid. Religion which caused Cardinal Gaspari Contarini to state, I cannot hide my indignation that some of the most illustrious Catholic cities are tainted with moral plague and loose ways to such a point that many monasteries designed to shelter virgins have now been turned into brothels. Can there be anything more abject and infamous? Religion which caused Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre to comment in 1977, the church is full of thieves, mercenaries and wolves. Religion that, as reported in Time magazine, Catholic institutions have recently paid out some $300 million in the United States in settlements of cases where priests have been accused of sexually abusing underage boys, and there is no end in sight to other pending cases. Notre Dame philosophy professor Ralph McGinnery said, we, the Catholic Church, could be sued out of existence. Religion where in Saudi Arabia they have a special religious police force to enforce religious laws, and where religious leaders this year called for the execution by beheading of nine women whose dreadful crime was that they actually dared to drive cars, and where the same religious leaders also wanted to behead every man who did not wear a beard for the purported crime of secularism. Religion where, according to Reuter, a resident of an ultra-Orthodox quarter of Jerusalem was excommunicated by his local religious court for the sin of possessing a defiling and disgusting object, a television set. I could go on citing examples like these for hours, but I'm sure you've got the idea. If this is what religious beliefs can lead to, violent intolerance and murderous behavior that would simply not be tolerated in any normal, non-religious society, I wonder if I could be considered guilty of what is termed British understatement if I were to suggest that maybe, just maybe, something might be wrong with religion. But rather than even hint at an answer, I would rather you form your own opinions and draw your own conclusions as you watch what follows. If there is an answer or a truth, surely it should not be based on myths thousands of years old myths which have caused so much death, suffering, and intolerance. There must be something more positive and benevolent than religion's enslavement and brainwashing of its followers with fear and threats of eternal damnation. Yet since the dawn of history, man has stubbornly maintained his beliefs in religions and the surrounding myths and superstitions. In this one area, he has barely progressed since the Stone Age. Surely, it is finally time, in fact long overdue, to open our eyes and take a good hard look at the facts, and only the facts, of what we call the naked truth. Most people understand that Christianity is an outgrowth of the earlier Hebrew faith. Consequently, you cannot understand Christianity correctly unless you first understand the faith of which Christianity is an outgrowth. That is why we have the Old and the New Testament. However, that's where most people leave it. An intelligent person who has done his homework knows that this is not where it stops. One cannot have Christianity without its parent Hebrew, and we cannot have Hebrew without its parent, the many more ancient Semitic religions. Hebrew is merely a recent occurrence in Semitic history. There is a Semitic religion behind Judaism, and behind the Semitic is Egyptian, and behind the Egyptian is Sumerian, and behind the Sumerian is a more ancient one. It's all a long Semitic bloodline coming through history. So let's start way back in ancient times where it all began. To get a better understanding of where religions come from, and where we are now in the 20th century in terms of our religious life, we have to go back a long way in time. Back all the way to ancient Egypt, in fact. To an Egypt that had never heard of Moses or Abraham or the rest of them. Because it was in Egypt, as you will see here, that the very basic roots and rudiments of both Judaism and Christianity was born. The ancient Egyptians realized that once a year 
at the time of the monsoon rains in Central Africa, uh, North Africa, being a desert, waited for the monsoon rains to come to Central Africa, the highlands. And, of course, when the rains came, they would overflow the tributaries flowing northward, which would be downhill into the deserts of North Africa, and the waters would eventually overflood the Nile, so that once a year the Nile Delta would become flooded. And that was a great and terrible tragedy each year. The great flood that came and washed away the Egyptians' world. The, they, were, they called the waters the waters of chaos. But the waters were chaotic and they just went everywhere. And while the waters of chaos were ter terrible and destructive, they also brought new life. Because without the waters of chaos coming, the deserts would be totally dry and nothing would grow. So they realized that the waters of chaos were a blessing, in fact, that brought new life. So each, each year when the waters of the flood would recede, leaving, of course, the fresh minerals and nutrients in the waters, which would then cause the food to grow, and spring would be a beautiful time in Egypt because of the waters of chaos. They celebrated the coming of the waters of chaos, bringing the new life. They call that celebration in Egypt the Arca Noah. Not the Ark of Noah, but Arca Noah. The Arca Noah celebration was the coming of the great flood that washed away the old world and brought new life and therefore Egypt was born again. And of course at this particular time of the monsoon rains, uh, the moon was always in the lower quarter. The lower quarter of the moon became known as the Arca Noah. The Arca Noah, or the wet moon. In Christianity, you have baptism. Baptism is, of course, being submerged in water. Because while, as I said, Egypt was submerged in water and was born again, the ancient peoples re related that when a child is carried in a womb, it is sealed in water. And that's the way you know a child's going to be born, is when the water breaks. And so, therefore, water was always associated with new life, being born. And that's why when you are converting from the evil old world uh, to Christianity, you must, be, you must be born again. You are baptized. It's actually a very ancient motif. All that we find in Judaism and Christianity, there is virtually not one concept, belief, or idea expressed in Judaism or Christianity. Not one. That cannot be traced back many, many times to many different religions. It's a very old, ancient story. It's the greatest story ever told. To show how ancient Egypt and its religions permeates the Old and the New Testament, here are some examples. During the rule of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten came an important religious change. Pharaoh Akhenaten was a very important pharaoh. He single-handedly changed the worship in Egypt from the worship of many gods to the worship of just one god in particular and to the exclusion of all other gods. The name of this god was Re. Pharaoh Akhenaten established that from now on there is only one God, the Son, and his full name is Amen Re, spelled A M E N R A. The Pharaoh said that when you pray to God, you must pray through the Son of God, Amen Re, because he represented God. And at the end of the prayer, in the ancient temples of Egypt, they would say, Amen. In the scriptures, Jesus said, if your eye be single, then there will be light in you. This single eye was the symbol of Amen Re, and the eye was always within the circle, the sun, the eye of God. There are at least three different places in the Bible 
where Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. For instance, in Ephesians 2.20, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And this is very important. Ask any architect or anyone who knows anything about the terminology of architecture, ask them, where do you find a chief cornerstone? Now, you can find an ordinary cornerstone at the top of a building or at the bottom. But where do you find a chief cornerstone? A chief cornerstone is translated from the Greek word meaning the peak of a pyramid or the capstone. Why the peak of a pyramid, you may ask? All you have to do is look at the back of an American dollar bill where you will find a pyramid with the chief cornerstone separated from the pyramid. But what is perhaps even more interesting is that on the American dollar bill within the separated cornerstone is the eye of Horus, the all-seeing eye of Iusus, the son of God the eye of Ray, that we pray to and say, Amen. In Isaiah 19.19, God says to his people, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. In other words, in the middle of Egypt, there will be an altar to the Lord. Well, in the very middle of Egypt stands Cheops, the Great Pyramid, exactly in the middle. Amazing? Yes. But even more so when you consider that it had already been sitting there for 3,000 years before the Bible was written. In John 10:11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life to the sheep. In John 10:14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. In the book of Hebrews 13:20, Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of his sheep. In the book of Revelation 12:5, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And in Revelation 19.15, and he shall rule the nation with a rod of iron. Well, we've now established that Jesus is the good shepherd who shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. The Pharaoh was referred to as the good shepherd. The people, the royal household, and the religious household of Egypt were called in Egyptian the shepherd's fold. Pharaoh, being the representative of Iusus, the son of God, was called the great shepherd, who looked after the shepherd's fold. The Pharaoh was considered to be the incarnation of Amen Re, who ruled for God on earth. And that is where we get the idea that there would be an earthly kingdom. And the Pharaoh was the king of the kingdom. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now you talk about an old concept and an old motif. That certainly is. Virtually all the ancient religions in the world had a Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, Buddhists today, a very ancient, ancient priesthood, far, far in excess of, of uh, Christianity, existed in the Himalaya mountains where the Buddhists have a religious leader called the Dalai Lama. Dalai comes from the word, Latin word meaning God. Dai, Dalai, God, Lama. A Lama is like a lamb. A Lama is a lamb. Therefore, the word Dalai Lama is God's lamb that takes away the sins of the world. It's a very old and widespread concept. God's lamb that takes away the sins of the world existed far before the Hebrews. Interesting, wasn't it? Amun Ray, or Horus as he was called, he was all that was good and righteous and holy. And he had his adversary. His name was Set. Sound a little bit familiar? Like with Jesus of Nazareth, who had his adversary, Satan. Horus, Set. Jesus, Satan. In fact, the resemblances between Jesus and Amun Ray, or Horus, and all of the other saviors of mankind are just too many. They go on and on and on. In fact, let's compare them, shall we? Let's compare Jesus of Nazareth with Horus of Egypt, with Krishna of India, and with Buddha 
of the Orient. Horus, baptized with water by Anup. Jesus, baptized with water by John. Anup the baptizer, John the Baptist. Horus, born in Anu, the place of bread. Jesus, born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Horus, the good shepherd, with a crook upon his shoulders. Jesus, the good shepherd, with a lamb or the kid upon his shoulder. The seven on board the boat with Horus. The seven fishers on board the boat with Jesus. Horus as the lamb. Jesus as the lamb. Horus as the lion. Jesus as the lion. Horus as the black child. Jesus as the little black bambino. Horus identified with tat or cross. Jesus identified with the cross. Horus of 12 years. Jesus of 12 years. Horus made a man of 30 years in his baptism. Jesus made a man of 30 years in his baptism. Horus the cursed. Jesus the Christ. Horus the manifesting son of God. Jesus the manifesting son of God. Two mothers of child Horus who were two sisters. Two mothers of child Jesus who were sisters. Set and Horus the twin opponents. Satan and Jesus the twin opponents. Horus the sower and Set the destroyer in the harvest field. Jesus the sower of the good seed and Satan the sower of tares. Set and Horus contending on the mount. Jesus and Satan contending on the mount. The star as announcer of the child Horus. The star in the east that indicated the birthplace of Jesus. Horus the afflicted one. Jesus the afflicted one. Horus as the type of life eternal. Jesus the type of eternal life. Horus who comes to fulfill the law. Jesus who comes to fulfill the law. Horus who came by the water, the blood, and the spirit. Jesus who came by the water, the blood, and the spirit. Horus of the two horizons. Jesus of the two lands. Horus walking on the water. Jesus walking on the water. The children of Horus, the children of Jesus. Horus entering the mount at sunset to hold conversation with his father. Jesus entering the mount at sunset to hold conversation with his father. Horus transfigured on the mount. Jesus transfigured on the mount. The seven loaves of Horus for feeding the multitude reposing in the green fields of Anu. The seven loaves of Jesus for feeding the multitude reclining on the grass. Twelve followers of Horus. Twelve followers of Jesus as the twelve disciples. The secret of the mysteries revealed by Tat An, the secret of the mysteries made known by John. Anup and Aeon, the two witnesses for Horus, the two Johns as witnesses for Jesus. Horus the morning star, Jesus the morning star. Horus who gives the morning star to his followers, Jesus who gives the morning star to his followers. Buddha was born of the Virgin Mary who conceived him without carnal intercourse. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary who conceived him without carnal intercourse. The incarnation of Buddha is recorded to him brought about by the descent of the divine power called the Holy Ghost upon the Virgin Maya. The incarnation of Jesus is recorded to have been brought about by the descent of the divine power called the Holy Ghost upon the Virgin Mary. When Buddha descended from the region of the souls and entered the body of the Virgin Maya, her womb assumed the appearance of clear transparent crystal on which Buddha appeared beautiful as a flower. When Jesus descended from his heavenly seat and entered the body of the Virgin Mary, her womb assumed the appearance of clear, transparent crystal in which Jesus appeared beautiful as a flower. The birth of Buddha was announced in the heavens by an ostrium which is seen rising in the horizon. It is called a messianic star. The birth of Jesus was announced in the heavens by his star which was seen rising on the horizon. It might properly be called the messianic star. The son of the Virgin Maya, on whom, according to the tradition of the Holy Ghost had descended, was said to have been born on Christmas Day. The son of the Virgin Mary, on whom, according to tradition, the Holy Ghost had descended, was said to have been born on Christmas Day. Buddha was visited by wise men who recognized in this marvelous infant all the characters of divinity, and he had scarcely seen the day before he was hailed God of Gods. Jesus was visited by wise men who recognized in this marvelous infant all the characters of the divinity, and he was scarcely seen the day before he was hailed God of gods. 
When Buddha was an infant, just born, he spoke to his mother and said, I am the greatest among men. When Jesus was an infant in his cradle, he spoke to his mother and said, I am Jesus, son of God. Buddha, the savior, was baptized, and at this recorded water baptism, the spirit of God was present. That is, not only the highest God, but also the Holy Ghost, for whom the incarnation of Gautama Buddha is recorded to have been brought about by the descent of that divine power upon the virgin Maya. Jesus was baptized by John in the river Jordan, at which time the Spirit of God was present. That is, not only the highest God, but also the Holy Ghost, for whom the incarnation of Jesus is recorded to have been brought about by the descent of the divine power upon the Virgin Mary. By prayers in the name of Buddha, his followers expect to receive the rewards of paradise. By prayers in the name of Jesus, his followers expect to receive the rewards of paradise. When Buddha died and was buried, the coverings of the body unrolled themselves and the lid of his coffin was opened by supernatural powers. When Jesus died and was buried, the coverings of his body were unrolled from him and his tomb was opened by supernatural powers. Buddha ascended bodily to the celestial regions when his mission on earth was fulfilled. Jesus ascended bodily to the celestial regions when his mission on earth was fulfilled. Buddha is Alpha and Omega, without beginning or end, the Supreme Being, the Eternal One. Jesus is Alpha and Omega, without beginning or end, the Supreme Being, the Eternal One. Buddha is to come upon the earth again in the latter days, his mission being to restore the world to order and happiness. Jesus is to come upon the earth again in the latter days, his mission being to restore the world to order and happiness. Krishna was born of a chaste virgin. Jesus was born of a chaste virgin. The moment Krishna was born, the whole cave was splendidly illuminated. The moment Jesus was born, there was a great light in the cave. The divine child Krishna was recognized and adored by cowherds who prostrated themselves before the heaven-born child. The divine child Jesus was recognized and adored by shepherds who prostrated themselves before the heaven-born child. Krishna was born at the time when Nanda, his foster father, was away from home, having to come to the city to pay his tax or yearly tribute to the king. Jesus was born at a time when Joseph, his foster father, was away from home, having come to the city to pay his tax or tribute to the governor. Krishna, although born in a state the most abject and humiliating, was of royal descent. Jesus, although born in a state the most abject and humiliating, was of royal descent. Krishna's father was warned by a heavenly voice to fly with a child to Gakul across the river Jumna as the reigning monarch sought his life. Jesus' father was warned in a dream to take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt as the reigning monarch sought his life. The ruler of the country in which Krishna was born, having been informed of the birth of the divine child, sought to destroy him. For this purpose, he ordered the massacre in all his states of all the children of the male sex born during the night of the birth of Krishna. The ruler of the country in which Jesus was born, having been informed of the birth of the divine child, sought to destroy him. For this purpose, he ordered all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof to be slain. One of the first miracles performed by Krishna when mature was the curing of a leper. One of the first miracles performed by Jesus when mature was the curing of a leper. Krishna was crucified and he is represented with arms extended hanging on a cross. Jesus was crucified and he is represented with arms extended hanging on a cross. Krishna descended into hell. Jesus descended into hell. Krishna, after being put to death, rose again from the dead. Jesus, after being put to death, rose again from the dead. Krishna ascended bodily into heaven, and many persons witnessed his ascent. Jesus ascended bodily into heaven, and many persons witnessed his ascent. Krishna is to come again on earth in the latter days. He will appear among mortals as an armed warrior riding a white horse. 
At his approach, the sun and moon will be darkened, the earth will tremble, and the stars fall from the firmament. Jesus is to come again on earth in the latter days. He will appear among the mortal as an armed warrior riding a white horse. At his approach, the sun and moon will be darkened, the earth will tremble, and the stars fall from the firmament. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, is it a coincidence? Or is there something else going on? That's a lot of similarity to say that it's a coincidence. But let's take another look. Let's go back 10,000 years before Jesus and look at the 16 other men that came along who claimed to be the Son of God, who were born of a virgin mother. And the virgin mother had the name of Mary, or a derivative of the word Mary, who were in the temple scolding and training their elders by the age of 12, who the ruler of the land, fearing that the Son of God had been born, tried to put them to death that they were asked by someone greater than they to move from the land they were born into a foreign land to save the life, who began their ministry at the age of 30, who ended their ministry at the age of 33, and who were killed on the cross. This happened in 16 different events prior to Jesus. Let's look at who they were. Krishna of India, 1200 B.C., the Hindu Sakya, 600 B.C., Thamuz of Syria, 1160 B.C., Witoba of the Telangonese, 552 B.C., Ayoa of Nepal, 622 B.C., Jesus of the Celtic Druids, 834 B.C., Kehalotti of Mexico, 587 B.C., Kerinus of Rome, 506 B.C., Asiculus Prometheus, 547 B.C., Tullus of Egypt, 1700 B.C., Indra of Tibet, 725 B.C., Alcestis of Euripides, 600 B.C., Attis of Phrygia, 1170 B.C., Crete of Chaldea, 1200 B.C., Bali of Chorissa, 725 B.C., and Mithra of Persia, 600 B.C. It just keeps coming on, doesn't it? Time and time again, we have to look at these similarities. Time and time again, we have to look at these Different men who had the same living patterns in life, even though their lives stretched over a period of 10,000 years. We're not dealing with myth. We're not dealing with belief systems. We're not dealing with faith. We're dealing with facts, historical data. It's there. You can't set that aside. Jesus had the same kind of life, did the same kind of things as Krishna and Buddha, and there they were, all 16 of these men. Coincidence? Ah, come on. Think about it. But that then leads to the question of just, who is it that we've been worshiping? Or what is it that we've been worshiping? What or who have we been living for? And more importantly, what or who has man been killing man for. Remember, religion has killed, murdered, maimed more human beings than any other force on earth. Well, the answer gets plain and obvious and perhaps difficult for a lot of people when we take a close look at the New Testament. In order to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have to first understand where the book comes from who wrote it. You have to understand it in the context of the time in which it was written. I'm going to make a statement now that many people who are in denial will not want to hear, but if you give me an opportunity, I think I can prove the point. The Bible is nothing more, Old and New Testament, nothing more than a retelling of the most ancient story the world has ever known. And that's why the Bible's called the greatest story ever told. And a cursory understanding of ancient history will show that the greatest story ever told was the story of the Zodiac. Astrology. The Bible is nothing more than the greatest astrological, astronomical story ever told. It is pure astrology based on the Zodiac. The fact of the matter is, if you've done your homework, you're going to find that the Bible is nothing more than astro-theology, the worship of the God's heaven. 
To further understand the connection between Christianity and ancient religions, we must study astronomy. Astronomy is a very precise science that we use today in determining, for example, when we will have the next eclipse or when we will see the next full moon. As far back as we can go in history, the year was divided into 12 equal parts, just as we today divide the year into 12 months. You draw a circle representing one year, which is then divided into 12 equal parts, each one of which is called a zodiac or a house. The sun travels through the different houses of the zodiac. This is where the connection between the Son of God having 12 helpers, as they were called in Egypt, and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who ministered to him, having 12 apostles. After dividing the circle into 12 equal parts, it was then further divided into four groups. The winter solstice, from the middle of the winter across the zodiac into the summer solstice. Then the spring, or vernal equinox, to the autumnal equinox. And there you have the cross on the zodiac. Remember, this is all ancient science, and it has been done like this for thousands of years. Now, as I said, those who would not want to hear this are in denial. But as a teacher, I'm asking only to hear what I have to say. In the book of John, in the New Testament, John 14, 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. Well, like many other scriptures in the King James, that was not correctly translated. In fact, it is not in my Father's house are many mansions, because in fact that makes very little to no sense at all. How can you have houses or mansions in a house? In my Father's house are many mansions is correctly translated, in my Father's abode are many dwelling places, in my Father's heavens are many houses. Well, of course, there's at least 12 houses in the heavens that we know of. In my Father's abode, the heavens, there are many houses. That's right, at least 12 houses of the zodiac. That's what was being said here. Now we go to perhaps the oldest book in the Bible, Job. And in the book of Job, I ask you to turn to chapter 38 and read with me, if you can, where in 38, 31, 32, and 33, something very important is said concerning astrology. In chapter 38, 33, first, the scripture says, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? In other words, there are ordinances in heaven. And 31 now, going back to 38, 31, God says to Job, according to the scripture, Can thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? What are we talking about here? The Pleiades, an astrological symbol in the zodiac. And God is supposedly saying to Job, can thou bind the sweet influences? What influences? I thought that that's all evil. That's all astrology. That's that new age stuff. We don't have anything to do with that. And here God is saying to his prophet Job, can thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Can thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Now, there is a heavy piece of information. God is saying to Job in 32, 38, 32, Can thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or can thou guide Arcturus with his sons? We're talking astrology here. Now, if you go to the King James Version, that's the version that God spoke. And if we read from the King James Bible, what the word Maseroth means. Here in the King James, in the interpreting, interpreting dictionary in the back of the King James, we look up the word Maseroth. And here we see Maseroth means the 12 signs of the zodiac. That's from the King James. Maseroth means the zodiac. And therefore, God is saying to his great prophet Job, can thou bring forth the zodiac in his season? That's right, because the zodiac has 12 seasons, 12 houses. And that's why God's Son, the light of the world, could say, in my father's abode are many houses. 
we're talking astrology here. But I'm going to tell you some of the most, one of the most interesting things you're going to find in the Bible about astrology is the end times. There is not a Christian program on anywhere that is not concerned with the end times, the last days, the end of the world. Jehovah's Witnesses are proclaiming all over the world that this is the end times. In fact, these are the last days. We are living in the end times. But the end times of what? If you understand that the Bible is nothing more than a retelling of astrology and the astrological zodiac, then you understand why it is that Jesus is referred to to have fed his people and his followers. God's son feeds his followers according to Matthew um, 14, 17. We read, and of course this is a very old story. We've all heard about how Jesus fed his followers with two fishes. And with two fishes and five loaves he fed his people. The two fishes are, of course, the two fishes of the zodiac, which is the constellation of Pisces. Pisces is always symbolized as two fishes. Consequently, God's Son, that thing that comes up in the morning, feeds his people on earth in the sign of the two fishes. Now, if you think we're stretching this point, just continue to listen. Jesus is referred to as the great fisherman, and of course that's why the Pope has the Pope's mitre, or the hat, or the headdress of the Pope, is the fish from Dagon, the fish god, because Rome ruled the world for 2,000 years under the age of Pisces. What house of the zodiac does God's son go into when he leaves the age of Pisces? Because he's been in the age of Pisces now for 1991 years, he's getting ready since each age is about 2,000, a little over 2,000 years long. What house will God's son go into once he has, once he has served the last Passover, which is the last year, the last Passover in the age of Pisces, the last year in the age of Pisces. Where does God's Son go for the next 2,000 years? Well, of course, we understand he goes into the age of Aquarius. Well, the age of Aquarius, that evil astrology, the age of Aquarius is symbolized if you can get any reference book, you will find the age of Aquarius is symbolized by the man with the water pitcher. The man with the water pitcher, or the water bearer, the water bearer. The age of Aquarius. But where did that story of the new age in Aquarius come from? It comes from the Bible. God's son, at Luke 22.10, when God's son is asked by his twelve apostles, as to where he will go to the next, after this 2,000 years of the great fisherman, or the fishes is over, where will he begin his new kingdom? He says at 22.10 of Luke, And he said unto them, Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. That's right. The man bearing a pitcher of water is Aquarius. It's very simple. Now, how do we know that the Bible is talking about the new Aquarian age or the old age of Pisces? All you have to do is your homework. I'm going to read some scriptures and I want you to follow what I'm saying, because I think it's very important. Let's start with Matthew 28, 20, and he says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In Matthew 12, uh, 32, the Holy Spirit will not be given either in this age or the age to come. In Matthew 13, 39, 
the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels, and the weeds are pulled up and burned in fire, so it will be at the end of the age. End of the age. That's what we're talking about, the end of the age, the Piscean age, the last days. Here in Matthew 24, 3, and what will be the sign of your coming? The apostles asked God, Sam, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? In Mark 10, we read in Mark 10, 29 and 30, and in the age to come, eternal life. So we're talking about the age to come. And here in Luke 19, no, Luke 18, 30. The kingdom of God will fail and receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. So we're talking about in this age, in the age to come. So we're talking about two different ages. Here in 1 Corinthians, we read again, 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 8. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age. And in 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it. Here in 1 Corinthians again, 10, 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us upon whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. We're talking ages in Ephesians 1, 21, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Hebrews 6, 5, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the coming age. In Hebrew again, Hebrews 9, 26, then Christ would have come, but had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the age. And in Revelation 15, 3, God Almighty is King of the ages. What we're talking about here is ages. The old age of Pisces, God's son ruling for 1991 years under the age of Pisces. And what we're looking forward to in the Bible is God's kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth. And that kingdom is the kingdom which is said, Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall be a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entered in. We're talking about getting ready to go into the new age of Aquarius, the man with the water pitcher. So when you hear Christians talking about the last days and the end of the world and the end times, we're talking about the end of the age of Pisces. We're talking about, yes, the end times, the end of the age of Pisces and the coming age of the man with the water pitcher. Now, when the end of the age of Pisces is coming, and we will be going into the new age of Aquarius, oh, but that's devil worship, that's evil, that's astrology. No, that's the Bible. We look around us today in all of the churches, and we will continually see the two fishes. The two fishes, as we said, are of Pisces. It is an appropriate symbol, and that's why Christians have the fish on the back of the card, Dagon, the fish god of Rome. The Pope wearing the, the uh, mitres, the, the Pope's mitre is nothing more than the fish head. The fish is a symbol of Christianity. But here again in Europe, 600 years ago, in a church in Europe, many churches in Europe have the same symbols. Here's one classic example of the symbol of Pisces in the stained glass window of a very beautiful cathedral in Europe. And of course it says Pisces. So while we may not have known about the connection between Pisces and Christianity, Middle Ages Europe was very well aware of the connections.
Now, with that look of the zodiac in mind, where does Jesus of Nazareth, or Krishna, or Horus, or any of the other 16 saviors fit into that zodiac? Well, could it be that they are representative of the sun, which is the largest and most important thing that passes in a cyclical way through the zodiac? Let's examine that for a moment. The ancient Egyptians believed that as long as the sun came up every day, there would always be life on earth. Therefore, quite logically, the sun became the representation for everlasting life. Put it another way, if the sun comes up every day, food will grow. If food grows, people can live and can reproduce. So that when you die, your son can carry on. And when he dies, his son will carry on, and so forth. So that as long as the sun, the light of the world, comes up every day, there will be everlasting life on earth. So quite logically, every major religion and mystic belief features the sun as its principal and most important feature. The Egyptians noticed that on their sundials, that in winter, as the sun moved further south, bringing, of course, our winter, that winter represents death, the coldness of death. And they noticed that when the sun went south, that it reached a point where it stopped in its movement and did not move any further south. And they began to notice on their sundials that it not only didn't go any further south, but it didn't begin to move back north either for three days. For three days, the sun sat exactly on the sundial in the same place. Therefore, the ancients said that the Son of God dies for three days and is resurrected or brought back to life once it begins its annual journey back to the northern hemisphere. And when it begins its annual journey back to the northern hemisphere was on December 25th. Therefore, the God's Son, the light of the world, who is our salvation because he is risen, was born or reborn on December 25th. Of course, the sun represented to the ancient people salvation because they believed, especially the Egyptians said that they noticed that if the sun continues to come up every morning, that life would continue on. When the sun comes up, the children awake, the men go off to work, and the world continues, and the flowers grow, and there will always be life on the earth as long as the sun comes up. As long as the sun is risen, there will always be life. Therefore, the Egyptians said that the sun of God, the light of the world, represented everlasting life on the earth. Not for you, but on the earth, everlasting life. That the Egyptians realized that the sun while burning was giving up energy and that the plants and the food chain on earth was receiving along with the humans and animals were receiving the energy from the sun therefore the sun was giving up its life for us here are a few churches that we drove by they're all completely unrelated but nevertheless they all display the cross but within that cross is a circle the church we're at now is a Presbyterian church. And as you would expect to find on any church, it does, of course, have a cross on top. But if you look more closely at many of these crosses, you'll find that there is also a circle within the cross. The circle is on the cross of the zodiac, and that circle represents the sun, the sun which comes up every day. But over the ages, man began to refer to this as the son of God, and therefore it became God's son. But what a cross with a circle in it like this truly represents is the sun waning or dying on the cross of the zodiac, and not a man. The sun, God, God's sun dies on the cross of the zodiac. The sun, the round orb that comes up in the morning, is what is correctly pictured on the cross and not a man. 
This church tells the whole zodiological story, the dying on the cross of the zodiac, and this small circle surrounded by twelve helpers or houses of the zodiac. Anyone can see that this is indeed a round orb with twelve signs or houses around it. It is the sun that is symbolized on this church and not a man. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 we read, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Let's read that again. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. The Son of God and the light of the world comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Well, of course, there is only one light of the world that every eye can see, and that's the sun. In the scriptures, we can also read how Jesus walked on water. All of us, I'm sure, have seen the sunset. Now, we are also told that the Son of God died with a crown of thorns. No wonder. That is precisely how the sun was always pictured in ancient days, with a crown of thorns, or sun rays. So the crown of thorns on Jesus, the Son of God, the light of the world, are the sun's rays. There is a phenomena that we call the procession of the equinox. It's a very interesting uh, phenomena, a natural phenomena, that the, the sun, while we on earth are circling or orbiting the sun, the sun itself is orbiting through the Milky Way galaxy. And it is going through the different constellations of the zodiac. And each time the sun leaves one of the constellations of the zodiac and goes into the next constellation of the zodiac, and that's all that old evil astrology. No, it's just history. It's just science. And each time it goes into a, it leaves one constellation and goes into another constellation, it enters the new constellation at the 30th degree. And it leaves that constellation for the next one at the 33rd degree. Therefore, God's Son begins his ministry to each one of his helpers at 30 and dies at 33. The ancient calendar didn't start with the year of January or Janor, the double-headed god of Rome, as we do. Instead, they started their calendar in a different constellation. To be precise, the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin. Consequently, the Egyptians and the ancient Sumerian cultures said that the Son of God, who died on the cross and was resurrected in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of a Virgin. This is why, in front of a pyramid, you have a Sphinx. The Sphinx has the head of a woman and the body of a lion. This symbolized the zodiac overseeing the pyramid because, as I mentioned, their zodiac began with Virgo, the virgin, the head of the sphinx, and ended with Leo, the lion, or the body of the sphinx, which symbolically was the complete zodiac. Now, as we have seen, all the crucified saviors were, in fact, nothing more than personifications of the sun. And, of course, that list goes on and on indefinitely back into ancient history. All races, creeds, colors, and movements have always personified their gods as the sun. But what about Jesus? It's true that he is referred to as God's son, the light of the world, who is our salvation because he is risen. But how do the churches themselves picture their Messiah, this Jesus? Let's see what some of the pictures from the literature of churches, how they perceived their Messiah.
With those developments along the Nile, long time ago, we see some very familiar stories emerging in our religious lore. Later, the Jewish nation, as it came out of Mesopotamia, seemed to have attached itself to those very familiar stories and made them very much a part of the Jewish religion, as we take a look now at the Old Testament. It is at this point I would like to remind that you should always be aware of any authority, institution, government, church, religion, anyone who is in the position of any authority that tells you that you should not read something in particular, or you should not look at a set of facts, or a particular book. Because usually anyone in authority who doesn't want you to read something in particular must have something to hide. Because the intellectual mind of the human being cannot grow if it is not allowed to look at all of the facts. We are told by Christianity that we're not to have anything to do with astrology, because that is evil and of the devil. Until we begin to look at the Old Testament with an academic eye, and not being swayed by religious conviction, but let's look at the actual Old Testament in the language that it was written in. And we're going to find that the Old Testament, like the New Testament, is nothing more than the entire story of the Zodiac. We have seen the New Testament is nothing more than astrology and some worship. Now we see that the Old Testament is going to be nothing more than astrology. And one of the most important points that we want to bring out, one interesting point that we might bring out is that the Hebrews, when they were in Egypt, were, of course, subject to the religion of Egypt. And at that time, Isis, spell I-S-I-S. Isis, the female personification of wisdom, from whence, of course, we get Mary in the Catholic Church, the mother of God. Isis was the female personification of wisdom, spelled, as I said, I-S-I-S. Later on, with the coming of Pharaoh Akhenaten, or Akhenaten, Pharaoh Akhenaten changed the worship in Egypt from Isis to Amen Re, or Amun Ra. Of course, this is where we get the term Re, R A, or R A Y, for Sun Ray. So Amun Ray became the chief deity of Egypt. Now, once the Hebrews left out of Egypt and went north into Palestine, they found a new god there of the Canaanites, a god that is referred to as the Ugaritic god of the uh, Middle East. That god was El, or the planet Saturn. The Hebrews then picked up the worship of the planet Saturn, or El, the Ugaritic god, and combining the Isis worship with the Amun Re worship, and, la and lastly with the El, Saturn, or the, or the god El, they formulate their new land based on the three concepts of God, Isis, Re, El, or Is, Ra, El, I-S-R-A-E-L. Mr. Michael Chandler. Solomon, wise King Solomon, is the sun in three languages, Sol, sun. Spanish, sun. The Eastern religions, Om, they chant Om for the sun, and Om, he's Egyptian for the sun. Jonah is an example of the sun going through the equinox. However, in this particular case, Jonah is Semitic for the sun, and Jonah's living inside the fish, inside the whale, for three days, which means the sun is at the winter solstice in the bellies and the bowels of the earth at the winter solstice and dying for three days. Now Samson, the adventures of Samson is equated to the adventures of Hercules. Samson was a solar myth. He had 12 unusual exploits or adventures around the zodiac. His strength was in his hair because in his hair were the sun's rays. When Delilah cut off his hair, in actuality, 
his rays were cut off. In the Old Testament, we are told that Moses comes down from the mountain after receiving the, uh, the law. And what does he find the Hebrews doing? He finds the whole nation worshiping a golden calf. Well, the golden calf was, in fact, nothing more than a personification of the sun again. The golden comes from the golden sun. And the calf comes from the astrological sign of Taurus. So the golden calf was God's son in his kingdom in the constellation or the zodiac constellation of Taurus, the golden calf, or the sacred cow, which is still worshipped in, in India today. And then, of course, the, um, the beginning of the new year, uh, the, and the more ancient Hebrews would blow the ram's horn. The ram's horn was, of course, celebrating the coming of God's Son, the Messiah, God's Son, the light of the world, who was going to come into his new 2,000-year kingdom in the age of, of uh, Ares, the ram, the lamb, ram, sheep of God. The, later on, the ram is called the Paschal Lamb, or the Lamb of God, which is Ares, the constellation of Ares, and that's why the Jews still today blow the ram's horn. And of course, in the old ancient Egyptian calendar, the month of spring was under Virgo, and therefore God's son is born of a virgin. Virgo, the virgin, the astrological symbol. It's really rather simple once you understand the story. The high priests of Israel would go out in the morning mist to find the manna from heaven. Those of you who have had the opportunity to study carefully will know that the word manna from heaven actually means mushrooms. The manna from heaven was actually a mushroom, sosilabin, the magic mushroom. And there's many books have been written about the subject of the magic mushroom in the Middle East. And I think we all know that in the Middle East there, had, there is the problem with hashish for thousands of years. And the drugs have been uh, floating around the Middle East for thousands of years. Uh, we find it in the Bible, the magic mushroom. Uh, we find in the scriptures that that which is referred to as manna from heaven is a word which means mushroom. Therefore, the high priest of God would go out in the morning, and of course, that's where mushrooms grow, is in the midst, in the dew, in the morning. And they would pick the mushroom, the manna from heaven, and of course, consuming the manna from heaven, they began to talk to God. In the book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, Mr. John Allegro, who was commissioned by the State of Israel for research, substantiates the taking of the magic mushroom by the ancient Semitic fertility cults in their sex worship, which predated and influenced modern-day Judaism. As we see pictured here, a, a drawing of the high priest of Israel. This is what the high priest of Israel looked like. You will notice that he is wearing a peculiar headdress. The headdress is because of the manna from heaven that the high priest consumed in their worship. The Hebrew god El was in fact a more ancient Semitic god, Saturn. And that's brought out very well for us here in Archive Orientali. Here we find in this excellent article that the Star of David the hexagram is actually the star of Saturn. And that's why today Hebrews worship on Saturday. Christians worship on the sun's day. God's sun, the light of the world. And there's, a, uh, there's still a disturbance among uh, religious circles today as to what the uh, correct day of worship is. Is the uh, day Saturday or Sunday? Well, it just depends on whether you're worshiping Saturn, the old ancient Hebrew God, or the Son of God, the light of the world on Sunday. It really doesn't make much difference. It's all Egyptian. If you go back, not to the Bible, not to Genesis, but to the most ancient writings in the world, 
the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Rig Gita, you will find that in the ancient nations of the world, they had all the same identical stories. They had the story of the young boy that was swallowed by the great fish because he didn't do what he was supposed to do. They had the story of um, Nemo. The Babylonians had the great lawgiver who had golden hair and went up into the mountain of God. The mountain of God was the pyramid. He went up into the great mountain of God and uh, he received the great law, which becomes known as the law of Hammurabi, the great law of Hammurabi. And that law was given to the Babylonians, say, their great prophet, their great man of God, who went up into the mountains, King Nebo. King Nebo, the great lawgiver who comes down from the mountain with the tablets of stone and gives the great law to the Babylonian people. Now, of course, the Egyptians picked that up, and you will find that in Egyptology, uh, the Egyptians had the same story. But their great lawgivers was called Mises. Mises was the great, wonderful man with beautiful golden hair who went up into the holy mountain, the pyramid, God's holy mountain. And he received the law. And the great law he brought down with the tablets of stone. And when he saw, Mises saw that the Egyptians did not respect the divine law. He broke the, the stones and the great law. Now, of course, the Hebrews, taking that story, moving into uh, Palestine with their worship of their god, El, then comes the story of Moses. Moses is Mises. Mises is Nebo. It's the same story. It never stops. Lastly, we would like to touch upon the Dead Sea Scrolls issue. Because if you don't know it, there is a very big controversy around the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, basically, it amounts to this. Those who have the authority and have control over the Dead Sea Scrolls do not want anyone else to have access to them because they are afraid that if outside authorities are able to examine the Dead Sea Scrolls, it might by chance uh, begin to cause questions in the Judaic Christian community about the authenticity of both Judaism and Christianity. And of course, the powers that be would not be very happy with that. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Qumran and they were found, they were a large group of old ancient documents written by ostensibly the, uh, the Essenic Jews. And they have caused much controversy in Israel, chiefly because Israel, the holder of the Dead Sea Scrolls, does not want anyone else to read them. They will read, Israel says that they will read the Dead Sea Scrolls and tell us what they say. But the problem is the world academic community says we want to read it for ourselves and Israel doesn't want anyone to read the Dead Sea Scrolls but themselves. Some 40 years ago, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in caves near Qumran. Just recently, the Huntington Library released microfilm of all the scrolls published so far for scholars worldwide. As a result, apparently the Israeli government is considering taking legal action against them, apparently based on an infringement of copyright. Well, that raises an interesting question. Whose copyright? The copyright of those who wrote them years ago and have been dead for many, many years? Or if they're God's words, then surely the copyright belongs to God. But if they are God's words, then surely the words belong to everyone and there is no question of copyright. Which raises another interesting question. Why would the Israeli government want to suppress their publication? It's interesting that we read from the Time magazine of January 14, 1991, that Mr. John Strugnell, the chief editor of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the man who was put in charge of the Dead Sea Scrolls by the State of Israel, after spending many, many years as the editor-in-chief, came out publicly to give his view of what he had studied, and the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
And he was quoted in a Jewish newspaper as saying that while he himself was not an anti-Judaist, he did declare, and I'm quoting from the Time magazine, that Judaism is a horrible religion with racist origins that in principle should not exist at all. The whole worship of the heavens is the story of the Old Testament. It is an encoded story that only those on the inside know. There is a story for the outside, for the ignorant, for the ill-informed. But the writers and those who are well-versed in Hebrew theology know that there is a second story interwoven into the story of the Bible. Well, we know that for a lot of you, this may have been a difficult experience, going through all of this with us. But we want you to know where we're coming from here at TNT. We're not here really to challenge your belief systems. We're not here trying to shake the moral foundation that you've built in your lives with your religion. We just want you to analyze and look closely at the data, historical facts, about what you have let your life get into if you're closely involved in all of these things around you that you associate with religion and how that's affecting your life. Every little bit of it. What are you involved in? What are you believing in? What is all of this history we have seen? Does it really relate to you? Now, there's no doubt about the fact that a lot of the great things that are taught to us all in our religions have some value that teach us to be good to each other, that teach us to be loving human beings. But we wonder about the religious that bring on rote and ceremony. Does that really do anything to make you a better person, a more godly person? Or are you casting it all under the guise of a myth? Myths got you nowhere. Ritual, rote, ceremony get you nowhere. It's what you are that counts. And can you find this godly you inside these myths? Or are you going to have to search someplace else for it? All we're doing is asking you to think very carefully about the information you have received here. It is valid. It is historical. If you believe some of the things you believe in, we feel that you have to believe in some enormous levels of consequence. But you're right, you can do that. But think about this. It might just change the way you view the entire world and the rest of your life. Let us throw some other light on this very important topic. We've invited Bill Jenkins to join us here at International Research. For seven years, Bill hosted Open Mind, which is KABC's highest rated talk show. It was a three hour talk show. And during those years, he, of course, interviewed many, many people, including some of the nation's leading thinkers, the most influential people on every topic, including spirituality and religion. Bill, good to have you with us here, and perhaps you could just for a moment elaborate on some of the people you did interview, and then tell us something about my comment on the burden of proof. Oh, certainly, Derek, and thank you very much for letting me uh, get in on this conversation. It's so very near and dear to my heart. During those seven years that we're talking about the existence of open mind, I had... Um, probably the greatest education I had received in life. I had all of my belief systems conveniently thrown out the window and a whole new set of values given to me, not only in terms of what is reality, the reality of science, the reality of re religion, the reality of spirituality. That is a very important subject, and we're hearing more and more about it. And so it was an awesome time. I, you know, and almost, I almost overloaded from it. But when we talk about what is the proof of God, uh, let me give you a, a different look at that for a second. Let's not, let's not even use the word God, because a lot of people think about this guy with a flowing beard. You know, this is the, uh, the image that's conjured up. Come on, let's talk about something else for a second. And I got most of my information, not from the theologians, not from the religionists, not from the priests or the preachers, not from the poets, but from the physicist, the scientist, who used to be in the forefront of atheism. 
And if you get to them now, you're finding that they're becoming more and more in the forefront of an absolute belief and knowledge of a great intelligence that was able to fashion together something as intricate as the human body or the entirety of creation. So we ask about proof. Just look around you. This did not happen out of happenstance. Little molecules got together and suddenly said, oh goodness, I think I'll be Derek today, or planet Earth, or whatever it was. Certainly there was enormous energy, there was enormous power, uh, there was something that put together the laws of the universe, if you want to call them that, something of incredible intelligence, and something that is that powerful. And look at the power it demonstrated. Something that is uh, that awesome, I think, requires our attention because we are a part of its creation, too. We are a living thing. We assume that that is a living thing, too. And if that's our father, that's our creator, let's try to be like that. So I think there's a lot of proof that, yeah, there is a creator. I don't want to personify that creator. I couldn't begin to tell you what it is. It's best described to me, possibly, as just a core of pure, loving energy. And the reason it's loving is because it is the nature and character and personality of that character. So we'll just call that love for the moment. Maybe we can get into that more later. Well, I think one of the important points you make there is the term that you will not personify. But of course, every religion in the world has personified that creative entity, whatever it is, mm -hmm. into a being either it has the long beard or whatever. it's whatever. Every religion forms its own concept of what it calls God. Yes. Well, I think it's time to get away from that. That's like being in kindergarten. Maybe this is what you needed to do for children. Bill, you just stressed quite a lot spirituality. Now, some people would or could define spirituality as being religious thought or religious philosophy. So I think perhaps it's important for our viewers, if you'd like to define what you mean by spirituality as opposed to religious thought or religious philosophy. Okay, uh, and good question, because it could be confusing. I think a lot of people say, if I am doing my religious ceremony, my religious rote, doing my beads, wearing my skull cap, doing all of these sort of things, that I'm doing something to improve the quality of life of my spirit. I am becoming more evolved. I am becoming more uh, godly. My second nature is becoming better, more in keeping with the, the harmony of God by doing all of these things, which basically is what religion is all about. My point is that the spirit is extremely important. It is, it's the force behind life. And you don't do it by ascribing to all of this religious uh, stuff. You do it by determining that you want to improve the quality of your spiritual life. And you do this by living. Yes, the spirit is important, but to train that spirit, to bring it to a higher level, is something that is deeply important, I think, to the individual and the creator. And it is a job and a task that, is, that goes only between the two. You don't have any side trips. You don't have anybody else that can do the job for you. Mother can't do it. The Pope can't do it. Only you can do it. You will do it or you won't do it. That is evolving the quality of spiritual life. Second to that, of course, it will naturally evolve the quality of physical life. A spiritual man just will not do those things that we see being done under the guise of religion. But my point there was that I believe today many religions and many people take what is written in the Bible quite literally at the face value of the words as they appear today. And I feel in so doing that they obviously create a great many problems for themselves and for the people who follow what they say. Now, these words were written many, many thousands of years ago. Perhaps you could give us some examples of how the meanings can be changed in today's understanding of the words and in the translations which have occurred over the centuries. Let's take the Bible that we're familiar with today as an example. The New Testament. Deal in for that for just a second. Written basically during the first century by a group of writers. We have the Gospels, we have the Epistles as they were, for Paul and the rest of them, and John's Revelation, all written between the years uh, 33 A.D. and about 92 A.D. In the beginning, during those first four centuries, let's take a letter to Paul, for instance, written to the church at Corinth, and the elders at the church at Corinth received Paul's letters. 
And then they very dutifully transcribed that letter and sent it on, say, to the church at Euphysia. And this went on throughout all of the churches. They didn't have fax machines then. Now, during this process that went on for four centuries, who knows how many times one of those scribes altered it or added something to it, wanted to clarify what was said based upon those things that had been going on for four centuries. In the fourth century, there was a Roman scholar by the name of Jerome who put together all of these teachings of the church. Each one of those churches were autonomous, you've got to remember. They were independent of each other. There were no bishops above them, and there was no pope. There was none of this going on, as was the intent of the early Christians. And that was known as the Vulgate, and all of those writings out of Greek and Arabic were then translated into Latin. Now, we have a lot of uh, areas in which there can be a great disintegration of the truth as was originally given by Paul or the writers of the Bible, what we would call the writers of the Bible today. Then in the early 1600s, they assembled about 300 scholars at Oxford University to go to the earliest witnesses, they called them, that they could find, which primarily was the works of the Vulgate, found in Rome and in Constantinople, and tried to put that into English. And that was known as the King James Version of the Bible. And that was the very first time that that had ever been done before, and it was then printed on the Gutenberg Press. Two years later, the Catholic Church came out with its own version, known as the DeWay version of the Bible, which very closely said a lot of things that the King James said, but it had a bunch of footnotes, and the Catholics were to read the footnotes, and that what the Bible said. To give you an example there, uh, Paul describes his meeting with Mary and Joseph and their children, the twelve children that followed Jesus. Now, the footnotes would say, well, <clears throat> Paul didn't mean children, he meant cousins because it's explicit in the Arabic that it originally went in that Mary and Joseph had children, but the Catholics couldn't accept that Mary had children under Joseph, so they made them cousins, even though there is a specific word for brothers and sisters and cousins. So here we see a degeneration of what was originally said there. And in fact, a specific distortion that's, of the truth. That's, that's exactly correct. That was the Duvet version versus the King James version, which so many Christians use today. But one of, the, one of the best examples there of how words can be twisted all the way around happens uh, when uh, Paul admonished the Christians to put on the armor of Christ. Well, in 1611, when the King James, uh, King James Version of the Bible was written, that meant something very, 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 you're going to get out there and fight. You know, you're very, very aggressive. In today's language, when you put on the armor, that's like getting in a tank. It's very defensive. So Christianity then was offensive, and today it's defensive, which is the reason that we saw new versions of the Bible come up, like the New English Bible, the Phillips Version, and on and on it goes, to try to change these changes in language that occur. We've had dramatic changes in the English language, which you and I speak, from the years 1946 to now. Very, very volatile changes in the language. We would have a hard time speaking with the vernacular of a 1946 person right after World War II, pre-television, pre-science. The language then was simple. It wasn't vulgar. It wasn't filled with all of the things that the language is filled in today. And it's interesting to note that uh, there are new, two new television shows that are having a very difficult time with their actors and trying to get them to speak the language of 1946. It's changed that much. Can you imagine what will happen 50 years from now? We will well, be able to understand those people. Also like try to understand what would have happened from three, four, five thousand years ago. Yeah, now we're, we're still trying. Years and, ago. and this is even without translations from one language to another. We're talking what you're just saying is in the same language. In the same language. So here I think you find a great deal of difficulty in trying to uh, say this is going to be the, the blueprint for my spiritual life something that has gone through all of these rigors, and to say that this is God speaking to me. Come on. Be careful about that. Bill, I'd like to thank you most sincerely for being with us today and for sharing your great knowledge and expertise. But there's something about which I'm personally curious, and I'm sure some of our viewers would also be interested in the answer. And that is why you chose voluntarily to involve yourself in something which is, after all, an extremely controversial topic. Well, there are a lot of reasons for that, Derek. First of all, when I heard what you were doing here and was made aware of the level of research 
that the organization has done and your effort to get this story out, it, uh, it struck me very, very personally. It is a story that needs to be told in its fullness and its completeness, something that I have been involved in quite uh, a long time myself in my own work. And now I see something even more and more important. We live in very, very strange times as we move into the 90s now. And uh, we see people all over the world, certainly here in the United States, but also in Europe, and particularly the Soviet Union, who are beginning to reach out for something that, is, that needs to be reached out for. And that is a way to improve the quality of their spiritual life. If we are not high-quality spiritual beings, we will never be high-quality physical beings. And we will see the wars continue, we will see the economic degradation of others continue, until we start walking the high moral ground on a spiritual level, because its physical level doesn't determine spirituality, it's spirituality that determines what you are physically as a man or a woman. And I see things in the Soviet Union where they have relaxed the grip of that authoritarian state over there. And the first thing we're seeing is great collections being taken to provide the Soviets with Bibles. Let's not add to the misery of the Soviet Union, if you don't mind. Let's start giving them something that has to do with their spirituality. Not the perpetuation of our own myths, our own problems, our own wars, as we've already gone into here. Why add to their misery? There's a better way. It's not going to solve anything. We have thousands of years of history to show that this is what tears apart nations and lives. So yes, I'm very interested in what you're doing. Let the Soviets think also about what's being said here. I would love to see it. Well, by profession, I'm supposed to be a man of words. But what I've learned during the making of this program has almost left me temporarily speechless. I'm equally sure that for many thousands of you out there, you will find what we've told you as fascinating as I have. And I'm equally certain that many thousands of others of you will be angered by what you've heard. But I hope either way it will have provoked you to think and question what perhaps up to now you've always taken for granted. And if you keep an open mind and bear in mind that what we presented to you are facts and that religious beliefs are really just that, they are beliefs. And if you'd like to know more, and my goodness, there is so much more to learn. Obviously, this has only been the tip of a very, very large iceberg, might even say the tip of the pyramid. The Society will provide you that information. Details of that will be up in a moment for you to call in and ask. And until next time, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us this evening on The Naked Truth. I'm Derek Partridge. Please write to the International Research and Educational Society, care of Lightworks Audio and Video, Incorporated, at P.O. Box 661593, Los Angeles, California, 90066. And thank you for joining us. I'm Derek Partridge. And now you can order this and many other fine tapes on the Internet at www.lightworksav.com. That's lightworksav.com, as in Lightworks Audio and Video. This has been a presentation of Lightworks Audio and Video Incorporated.